Hello everyone, this is International Master Savi Vaughn here. Today we're going to talk about an interesting topic, uh, one which I think is not really being um, dealt with so often in chess literature or chess um, videos. So this is the topic or concept of uh, restriction in chess. So uh, what do I mean by this? Let's try to define approximately what I'm talking about. Restricting means avoiding certain squares or certain moves from your opponent. So in order to make this type of moves, restrictive or restriction type of moves, first of all we have to consider what exactly the opponent wants to do, what kind of squares his pieces seek to, to go on, and then try to perhaps stop it in some um, some means so I've chosen to illustrate <coughs> excuse me so I've chosen to illustrate this topic with you using two games illustrative games one of them is a pretty high profiled game with a uh, Nigel short playing with the white pieces versus no other than Gary Casper with the black pieces this is if I'm not mistaken from their uh, world championship match so uh, short had the white pieces here it is uh, white to move white as we can see has some space advantage here you see he has a far advanced e pawn his queen and bishop are nicely centralized black is a little bit passive but if white is not going to do anything special in couple of moves from now perhaps black is going to untangle himself and kind of liberate himself from White's holding onto his position. So what should be White's first move? In order to understand this, we need to ask ourselves what is probably going to be our opponent's next move. So understanding that Black is very much cramped, he would like to first of all, if he could, exchange some pieces. One such option is to play moves such as Bishop to C5. The idea is to exchange that strong bishop on d4. And once those bishops are exchanged, black's rook might invade the second rank. Also, this diagonal might be compromised. And in general, black's position would be less compromised, having less pieces on the board, because uh, white has more space. Basically, his pieces have easier times maneuvering from one square to another. So Nigel Short understood that, understood that very well. So he understood that a key moment here is to prevent the move bishop c5 from the opponent and thus keeping him in a cramped position. So the first move should be pawn to b4. This was played. Now black cannot play the move bishop to c5. Without having that move, the bishop on e7 is kind of doomed to passivity. And the white's bishop on d4 is a, quite a formidable piece which make sure that all of white's pawns and sensitive squares are being well defended. Another problem that black has in this position, maybe the biggest problem, is this very much passive knight on e8. This knight is on the 8th rank. He would like to get some more activity in the next moves. This is why Kasparov played a very logical move, knight to g7. His idea is to Plant the knight on f5, a very nice and centralized square, also putting some pressure against the bishop on d4. But Nigel Short kind of kept his prophylactic mind very much uh, in motion, and he understood that it was also a key moment to prevent the move knight f5 from happening. So what he came up with is the move pawn to g4 also. Very surprising move because some of you might say, well, but isn't this a very much of a weakening move? And while this is true, the white king is being slightly compromised, white is having such a dominant position and black pieces are so passive that it's very unlikely that black will have real chances of attacking the white king. It's actually the black king who is in more danger of getting under attack as we shall see very very soon 
So with these two key moves, pawn b4 and pawn to g4, white kind of made sure that black would not get any activity in this game. And after those two kind of defensive type of moves, he went on to prepare his attack slowly. So black played the move h5, trying to untangle himself. Now it would be a terrible mistake, for example, to capture the pawn on h5, because then all of our previous previous achievements of restricting that knight will be gone, the, the knight will be happy to recapture on h5, and even though h5 is not, let's say, the greatest square on the board, it's definitely better than g7, so we should not allow this. White played the move h3, very good, maintaining that pawn on g4 if needed. Black played pawn to a5. So you can see that black is doing he's having kind of very hard times liberating himself but he's doing his best with the move a5 he's trying to once again liberate this square on c5 for his bishop so for example if white captures that pawn on a5 once again black is happy to swap off some pieces short is not allowing this he's playing the move pawn to a3 so now if black takes on b4 he is ready to recapture with his a pawn perhaps even having some options to invade with his rook on the 7th rank, so no reason for black to capture. Black plays rook to d7, clearing the square on d8 perhaps for his queen or his rook to add some pressure on white's position. But since white kind of finished making all of his uh, prophylactic preparatory moves, he's now launching his attack. He played a very strong move, rook to f3. Preparing to bring his last piece, his rook on a1, into the game, into the attack to f1. Black played the move queen to d8, setting up a small trap. So if white just continues with his uh, plan, with the move rook f1, if you want you can try to spot black little, like a small tactical re resource that he has in this position. If you want you can stop the video to do that. So the resource goes... Pawn takes before, and after the pawn recapture, black has bishop takes before, and the pawn cannot take back because his bishop would hang. And that would be an unfortunate loss of a pawn. So, short is paying attention to the little details. He plays rook to b1. This is maybe his third prophylactic move in this game, thinking about his opponent's plans and preventing them. Very good. Black plays bishop to g5, trying to untangle himself a little bit, but after the move rook to f1, now there are no more tactics on b4. Black captured, and he found nothing better than just to go back on e7, but you can see that white's attack here is already extremely strong. His pieces, all of them are very well centralized, very well placed, and as we know, in chess, when all of your pieces having good squares and they are optimally active, we should definitely have some tactics at our disposal. So in this moment, white should be ready to attack. He should seize his chance to take advantage of his well-placed pieces. So he found a good moment to take on h5, forcing the move knight takes h5, and now the tactics started with the move rook takes f7, breaching kind of black's defenses. I would be happy to go with the, all of the different little details of White's attack here, but this is not our theme in this video. For the sake of completion, I will show you the, well, the just the final moves of this game. Queen uh, Rook takes f7, King takes f7, Queen takes g6, King f8 is forced, and now White just plays Queen h6 check, and after Knight g7. A very fine final move, bishop g6, maybe also a touch of a prophylactic move, preventing black's king from escaping the attack, and black was forced to resign as there is no way to prevent the move queen h8 checkmate. So this was the game short versus Kasparov. You see that the very key moments in this game were back at move number 19 and 20, basically the first move was b4, preventing bishop c5. The second move was the move pawn to g4, preventing also the knight.
from entering back to the game. And you, you saw that Black couldn't really find any satisfactory ways to get back into the game and, and slowly became, um, began to crumble until he got lost in White's very strong attack. Let's move to the next example. example. This is a game of uh, far less uh, famous players, but very decent uh, players still. In this position, it is White to move. We see a similar scenario where White has a space advantage in the center, thanks to his far advanced pawn on d5. So, what do we want to do in this such a position? We want to prevent our opponent's counterplay. We want to prevent his plan. So let's ask ourselves, first of all, what would Black would like to do if it was his move? That's a good way to approach such a position. So if it was Black's move, first of all, perhaps he would like to jump with his knight to some more active square than he currently is. Another plan that Black could have is to develop his bishop and then try to exchange some pieces on g5. Once again, the side who has less space is happy to exchange pieces. This is why White perhaps would like to avoid that. So understanding this, White came up with a simple but very effective approach. First of all, he played the move pawn to g3. Already a nice move, restricting this knight on g6 completely. Now this knight has no future, no active squares to aim for. Black continued with his plan of bishop e7. Now he is ready to play bishop to g5, swapping off some pieces. But now the viewers probably would also want to try to guess white's move. And this is the move pawn to h4. Not only stopping the bishop from coming to g5, but also creating an idea to push white's, uh, black's knight even further away uh, from the center with the move h5. So a very good move there by white. Uh, black found nothing better than just to castle. And now once white finished making his um, kind of re restrictive type of moves, prophylactic moves, he now went on to improve his own position. He played the move bishop to d2. Not the only move, but a very sensible developing move. Black played b6, perhaps thinking about activating his rook through a7. And now white went for a very nice maneuver, knight to d1. He is already having in mind the square on f5, which is a very nice square for the knight. And after the moves, knight to d7, knight e3. Black played knight f6, trying to activate his knight. But after the moves, h5, knight to h8 and knight to f5, black is already in an extremely difficult position. Not only white's knight is extremely strong on f5, just look at this miserable knight on h8. You can practically say <coughs> sorry, that this knight on h8 is um, practically dead. He cannot really participate in the game. And the game ended actually sooner than expected. Black played the sensible move rook to a7, trying to perhaps defend his position a little bit. But after the move h6, Black just resigned. Because if he plays the obvious move pawn to g6, there is knight takes e7, queen takes g7, and the simple move bishop to g5. Black simply has no ways to defend the knight on f6. And Black resigned. So in this video, as you can see, we saw some examples of a new concept, the restriction. Sometimes we want to try to stop our opponent's active ideas and plans by using some smart moves. This type of moves also, besides having a very strong practical meaning, also have some of um, a little bit of a psych psychological advantage. When you play a move and you are not allowing your opponent to execute his plan, very often they become uh, frustrated about not being able to execute their plans. Very often they might uh, get upset and make a, some kind of self-destructive type of move. So really try to consider this kind of move during a game. They can be very effective. 
So uh, really hope you enjoy this video. Uh, uh, if you like this kind of uh, middle game uh, strategies ideas, I can recommend you uh, go and check out uh, my course on the middle game strategy from the uh, store of the Remotes Academy. It's a really good one, three hours uh, running time, if I'm not mistaken, talking about all kinds of middle game strategies to boost up your game. So, thank you all for watching. See you guys in the next videos. Bye-bye.